All right, students, thanks for tuning in. Let's take a look at population and factors that affect population in our societies. This presentation will help you understand how wealth, poverty, and status of women affect population growth and dimensions of HIV and AIDS. So here in this graph, it's pretty simple. We see that less education, more babies. Ethiopia, only 5% of women are enrolled in secondary school, AKA high school, whereas in Jamaica, um, over 80% are enrolled. And in Jamaica, the fertility rate is about 2.4. Ethiopia, 6.6. So big differences here. More educated women have fewer children. That's borne out through many studies. We know that family planning, healthcare, and reproductive education can lower TFRs. And here we see some women that are part of a program called the MATLAB Project in Bangladesh that provides visits from local women offering counseling, education, and free contraceptives. And we saw in the data um, earlier that that has allowed their TFR to decrease from about seven down to about three in only about, you know, only a few decades. A little FYI here, how many of our, um, how many of our governors are women? So if you take a look at percentage of national parliamentary seats held by women, it's pretty low. Sweden is the highest, 45%. Argentina, pretty high. Vietnam, Canada, US, around 15%. But many countries have no representation by women, like Saudi Arabia. Poverty is correlated with population growth. The more poverty, the more the population growth. And here's some numbers. Let's just take Ethiopia, one of the lowest per capita GNI, that's gross national income. And they have a big population increase per year, 2.5%, almost 6 TFR, infant mortality very high, incidentally, percentage of couples using birth control, only 6%. Let's contrast that with the U.S. down here at the bottom. Average income, 39,000, and population increase, 0 0.6, 2.0 TFR, pretty close to the, re pretty, pretty close to the um, replacement fertility rate of 2.1. Infant mortality rate, 7, which is still strikingly high for the U.S. And percentages of couples using birth control, 68%. That highest number is 86% in China, where, of course, they would have incentive to only have one child. And um, so there's a pattern here. All of these numbers increase, are, are, sorry, all of these numbers decrease, except for the last column, as, uh, as income increases. So we know that poorer countries will experience most of the future population growth, areas like Africa and South America. In fact, developed countries, um, their rate is um, practically stabilized. Whereas in developing countries, this is where we are right now. You can see here that most of the current population, about 6 billion, are in developing countries. And we would say about 1 billion are in developed countries. And so they're still on a big, um, on a big upswing here. In fact, we can say 98% of the next billion people born will live in developing nations. So what about population growth? Well, it can lead to environmental degradation. Here we see an area in Africa's Sahel region where there's overpopulation. It has led them to overgrazing of semi-arid lands. You already have land that is not heavily ir irrigated, but because you're trying to, um, you know, you're trying to carve out an existence on this land. You have animals that are giving you your sustenance through milk and, and meat, but these animals have to graze. And so when you overgraze, you lead to a condition that we call desertification, taking land that's fertile and turning it into desert. And this is, um, this is a common thing that happens in many areas where the land is not managed. Compare this, well, poverty can lead to environmental degradation, as we just saw an example of, but on the other hand, wealth and resource consumption can produce even more severe and far-reaching environmental impacts, such as illustrated in this um, cover of Affluent magazine, where um, obviously having um, uh, meat, which is, we know that meat has a greater environmental toll, it takes uh, due to the food energy pyramid, where we're now eating on the higher trophic levels. So. It takes more resources to do that. 
So ecological footprint, we've looked at it before, but let's just clearly define is the cumulative amount of Earth's surface area required to provide the raw materials a person of a population consumes. You need those materials in the form of food, water, minerals, whatnot, and then to dispose of or recycle the waste that is produced. So in theory, you could be living in some kind of a closed loop. So this is the global footprint going back starting in 1960 when this, these calculations were begin to be made. Uh, 1960 took about half of an Earth to support Earth's population. No problemo. But as time went on, what happened in 1985? Right here. Did we cross the bridge of no return? Will we ever go down back below this level? And why 1985? Why did this not happen earlier? Why did it not happen later? What were some of the factors that led to that? Well, part of it is the wealth gap. Residents of developed nations have larger houses, more possessions, and more money than residents of developing nations. And more nations are becoming developed. In fact, the richest 20% of the world's people consume 86% of its resources and has more than 80 times the income of the poorest 20%. Not 80 times, it's not like double or triple, but 80 times the income. And here we see a family in the US compared to a family in Egypt in terms of their, in their, in terms of their physical possessions. Big difference. So the last thing we'll take a look at here though as a societal factor is HIV and AIDS in human population. AIDS is a significant problem primarily on um, in the African continent. And in fact, one in five people in southern African nations are infected. It kills babies born to infected mothers. It has orphaned 14 million children who now have either no, have no parents. And it has cut 19 years off life expectancies in parts of southern Africa. So this has profound influence on on a population. You're basically losing your young people. And the young people are, like yourselves, are the driving force for change happening within countries. They're also, they're the innovation. They're the new creative energy. They're the new workforce. Um, they are really the foundation for the future of your country. And so what does it mean when you have so few um, healthy, able children? Time will tell. We'll see. But it has been a major strain on African countries. So here we see the number of HIV infections has really changed or grown a lot. In the mid-80s is when you first heard about AIDS. I remember being in sixth grade and hearing about a famous actor who was the first one to, um, the first well-known person to die of AIDS. And that was uh, mid-80s, and since then it's been a big problem. There's, these are the infections in red, these are the deaths. So with treatment, you can actually live an entire life um, while having the HIV virus in your blood. But in Africa, usually that treatment doesn't occur, and so we get a lot of deaths. So I would take, I'd like you to take a moment, and at the end of your notes, review what you've written down, and write a summary where you synthesize together the ideas. And uh, see you in class tomorrow.